Hi, I'm Sonu Jain at The Ohio State University. I'd like to welcome you tonight to our uh, combined hand-in-hand -hand series webinar that the AHS is doing with the American Society of Hand Therapists. And I'd like to introduce you to our uh, moderator, Gail Severins, and our topic today will be Small Joint Arthroplasty Revisited. Gail? Thanks, Zeno. And welcome everybody to the combined webinar. Um, it's a joint collaboration with AAHS and ASHD, the American Association American Society for Hand Therapy. And uh, I, we have a dis very distinguished uh, panel this evening. So I'd like to introduce them briefly and then get right to our speakers so they can share their wonderful knowledge with us. Up first, we have Sherry Felcher from the Philadelphia Hand to Shoulder Center, and Sherry will be discussing non-operative management for finger PIP and MCP joint arthritis. We'll then move on to Dr. Mark Riz Marco Rizzo from the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, who will be discussing the surgeon's perspective on small joint arthroplasty. Gary Solomon, the director of Metro or Chicago Metro Hand to Shoulder Therapy, and former ASHT president, as well as the current chairman of the American Hand Therapy Foundation, along with Dr. Janine Beasley, professor at Grand Valley State University in Grand Rapids, Michigan, will be discussing postoperative interventions for these cases. And we'll be wrapping up with Haley Van Escobar, who is joining us from Seebeck, Washington, and she is uh, uh, involved with Restore Performance Therapy, and she will be just discussing the collaborative approach to elective arthroplasty. So we invite you to post any questions or comments that you have in the chat section. Our, our panelists can answer those questions there, and we'll also leave time at the end for discussion. And we hope to have a lively discussion at the end. And please remember that this webinar is being recorded and will be available to any of the participants afterwards on the AAHS website, which is handsurgery.org. So without further ado, I will go ahead and turn this over to Sherry. Thank you, Gail. Trying to get my slides up. There we go. Um, so as Gail said, I've been asked to talk about non-operative management of PIP and MCP arthritis. We know arthritis is a leading cause of disability in adults. Conservative management requires an understanding of the disease process, specific conditions, potential deformities, and especially individual patient needs and their effect on ADLs. So, and I'm not gonna do this justice because I don't have a lack of time, but I do feel it's important to at least touch on the conditions that you'll be seeing in the clinics so that you have an idea of what to look for or what you'll be seeing. So rheumatoid arthritis is probably the most common of the uh, inflammatory conditions. It's chronic, systemic. The primary hallmark is synovial inflammation, uh, which leads to a loss of articular cartilage and bone. You'll see intrinsic tightness, joint instability, tendon disruption in the form of decentralization, tendon rupture, um, all sorts of different things. You can also see secondary deformities, things like boutonnieres deformities, swan neck deformities. Osteoarthritis is a chronic degenerative disease, most frequently affecting the DIP joints, then the CMC of the thumb, then the PIP and the MCP joints. And you'll see characteristic deformities like swan neck and boutonniere deformities. You maybe also see um, Heberden's nodes, Bouchard's nodes, which may have implications for splinting and comfort with patients. Systemic lupus erythematosus is an autoimmune connective tissue disease, with high variability of clinical systems, but you'll see a characteristic butterfly rash, possibly on the face, the upper extremity, um, when the web spaces of the um, fingers. Arthritis and arthralgia affect 95% of the cases. Uh, could see Raynaud's disease, swan neck deformities, but they tend to be more uh, soft and feels because of ligamentous laxity. About 10% will develop MCP joint ulnar deviation deformities. Psoriatic arthritis is an inflammatory musculoskeletal disease associated with psoriasis. So it resembles rheumatoid arthritis, but with psoriatic skin lesions. Now changes, DIP joint changes. And scleroderma is a chronic connective tissue disease characterized by vascular, immunologic, and fibrotic changes that affect multiple internal organs, muscles, tendons, joints, bone, uh, blood vessels and skin. It can be life-threatening. 
The first sign we might be the first to see in therapy is a progressive skin hardening and thickening often at the digits. And you could see a deformity with the MP joints and extension with the PIPs and DIP joints in flexion. And there may be accompanying Raynaud's disease. So the goals of therapy with this, these patient populations are to reduce inflammation, decrease joint trauma, decrease pain, facilitate proper joint alignment, improve function and ADL performance and prevent further losses of function in a lot of education in terms of activity modification, assistive devices, things like that. So we do have some evidence for treatment. Um, this first is with a study discusses rheumatoid arthritis, where they used three groups and one group only was educated in joint protection. The second group had joint protection education, a set of hand stretches, and the third group had hand strengthening and mobilizing stretches on top of that. And they concluded that there was a statistical significant improvement in arm function demonstrated in the group that had the home strengthening exercises. When we look at osteoarthritis, um, and there's uh, quite a few different studies, and from these studies, there's moderate evidence that hand exercises improve grip, grip strength, range of motion, and function. Uh, moderate evidence that joint protection and home exercise programs improve grip strength and global hand function. There from this systematic review and meta-analysis, there was no evidence that there was a significant effect on grip strength and hand function with resistance training and a small clinically unimportant pain relieving effect. And finally, this uh, last study by Jeanine Beasley, who will be speaking later tonight, um, looked at conservative therapeutic interventions, uh, active range of motion, resistive exercise, joint protection, electromagnetic therapy, paraffin, balneotherapy, which is, um, mineral, uh, soaking in mineral water combined with or without mud packs, magnetotherapy and DIP orth orthosis. And um, while the evidence varied in quality and effect sizes, there is support for the use of these things. So I wanna talk a little bit about how I treat my patients. And I spend a lot of time on orthotic intervention, which is supported by the evidence to decrease pain and inflammation, improve function, minimize deformity. Uh, patients often find simple stretch gloves worn lightly to be very helpful in decreasing morning pain and stiffness. Wrist or finger orthosis may be used to enhance joint stability and improve function. And there's also orthotics that we use to correct deformities. And the patient case that you can see here, this was a patient who had a traumatic injury that resulted in osteoarthritis of the PIP joint that resulted in an ulnar deviation lag or um, ulnar ulnar deviation at the PIP joint, which was significant because of the missing length of the index finger, he couldn't oppose. So I fabricated this little splint and you can see I'm pulling the joint opposite to the direction of deformity, which was ulnar, so I'm pulling him radial to correct it. And this did quite well for him and he was able to oppose to the long finger with it um, after using it. The classic deformity that we deal with the MCP joint is ulnar drift, vulnar subluxation or dislocation. It's most commonly seen in RA, um, but you can also see it with lupus, and it could be due to a variety of different reasons, things like instability of the collateral ligaments, EDC decentralization, overstretching, intrinsic tightness. I think wrist collapse is one of the most significant ones because it, you kind of get a zigzag deformity, and that leads to radial deviation of metacarpals, and that increases the tendency for the ulnar deviation. And in addition, just the forces that we put on our hands with um, daily ADLs contribute to the deformity as well. So I do like to make sure that my patients have a good resting hand orthosis for a night wear. This photo on the right at the bottom is I used uh, thermoplastic inserts between the digits to correct alignment. Um, which I find can be helpful for some patients that don't have the ability to fuss with a whole lot of different straps. But I also uh, will fabricate it with using Velcro dividers. And what I'll do is I'll get the alignment set and pull radially. And then once I get everything lined up, I'll attach the straps so the patient only has to pull one strap over. But you want to be sure that you don't use a long lever arm so that you're gently gliding the joint into alignment rather than tilting it so that you don't wear away uh, the joint. And you also want to be sure that you align the wrist first, because if the wrist is is deviating as well, that can affect your alignment at the MCP joints. Uh, soft functional orthosis are also very helpful. And we do have some evidence from this Cochrane study that they can be decreased pain and improve strength and decrease hand movement and they're readily available. Um, and these are just some of the different ones that you can easily find online. You can also fabricate them out of neoprene if you're handy. 
Uh, relative motion orthosis is also, um, I find, really helpful with this population. And this was a great study by Lynn Feehan, uh, where she published a case report where she, speaking with and interviewing different patients with rheumatoid arthritis and basically describing different orthotics used for different patients during different activities. And this was eye-opening for me, and I really can't wait to try it with my next patient, just in terms of fabricating different splints to improve function during different functional tasks, because we know that with these patient population, different tasks will send the deformities in, um, some will accentuate them, and some will not. So uh, having different splints can be very helpful. Swine neck deformities you'll also commonly see in splint four, um, characterized by PIP joint hyperextension and DIP joint flexion, which can lead to problems initiating flexion, gripping, and comprehensive um, hand activities. So I'll use oval eights, or sometimes if they, especially if they have a mallet type deformity with a swan neck, I like the little splint on the right, treats everything at one time. Uh, silver rings are very helpful also with this pa patient population. In this study, they found a 74% reduction in pain and 76% improvement in daily functioning. And the largest improvement was seen with household chores, opening jars and groceries. I do like to start with the oval eights. Um, they're handy. I have them in a clinic. I can fit them with the patient before they make the determination if a silver ring will be good for them. Or they're a little bit more expensive. Boutonniere deformities characterized by posture flexion at the PIP and hyperextension at the DIP. If they have good passive extension, I might use a simple circumferential orthosis or uh, relative motion for active exercise. The next slide was a photo that a patient came in that made themselves a splint out of Legos, which I thought was a pretty cool idea. Um, if the joint is a hard end feel, I like to go the route of serial casting. I find that that's most effective in getting the contracture worked out where I can get them to the point where we can work on active extension as well. Joint protection is a huge part of what I do with this patient population. We have strong evidence um, for effic efficacy and instruction to decrease pain and promote ADL performance. There's six general principles um, that I like to teach patients respecting pain, balancing rest and activity, exercising in a pain-free range. We wanna teach them to avoid positions of deformity. And I put this photo here because often when I'm doing my initial evals, patients will sit and they'll position their head on their hands and that will increase the ulnar deviation deformity. So I like to start my education right there during the initial evaluation that that's something that can extenuate the deformity or make it worse. Also wanna teach them to reduce effort and force and use larger or stronger joints to do the work. Spend a lot of time with activity modification, discussing specific do's and don'ts for individual patients to avoid aggravating their specific deformity, teaching them things like stirring a pot with a neutral wrist or holding a book or a plate palm up as opposed to pinching, which can further extenuate those uh, ulnar deviation deformities. Energy conservation instruction can also help to decrease pain and fatigue and increase physical activity. It, Amazes me how many patients aren't aware of the wealth of assistive devices that are available. Uh, I like to start in the clinic with simple things like built up handles on utensils or pens um, and start them in regular household things like using a pizza cutter to cut their food. And these things are just so easily available now. Electronic devices, um, you know, your food processors, your electric can openers. Um, they're just so easily available and can really be helpful to this patient population and people just are not aware. As far as exercise and strengthening go, general, general active range of motion exercises include wrist and digit extension and flexion and thumb opposition. You want to control the reps so that we don't overstress vulnerable tissues and prevent overstretching joint structures. Avoid painful motion. Work within your patient's level of comfort. Don't create deforming forces with your exercises. Ultimately, the exercise program will depend upon the involved structures. For example, if the patient has intrinsic tightness, that can lead to a swan neck deformity. That they may require intrinsic stretching and lengthening exercises. We know that 20 pounds of grip strength is necessary for most ADLs. Um, again, these patients, if they have a lot of deformities, they may not tolerate a grip strength assessment with a JAMR. You can use a sphygmometer to assess grip pressure and use that for goal setting but strengthen cautiously to avoid aggravating deformities and don't sacrifice stability for a potential increase in strength. I do use modalities and we do have some evidence that paraffin baths will decrease pain and stiffness. Superficial heat can decrease pain, but during periods of acute inflammation when um, 
joint temperatures are elevated, superficial heat is contraindicated. And I'm not sure that most people know that. TENS can be used to decrease pain and morning stiffness, neuromuscular ESTEM to improve hand function when it's used with the first dorsal inner assay. Ultrasound can decrease pain, improve wrist extension, improve quality of life. And I threw cold on here, just that it's a contraindication if the patient has rhinouts. And finally, last slide, this is a 34 year old right hand dominant female with rheumatoid arthritis that presented for evaluation. She had a rheumatoid nodule, the ring finger PIP joint and pain. MRI ultimately showed injury to the extensor paratus. We initially splinted her um, with a combination of a circumferential type splint orthosis with an oval eight. Um, she was splinted for about four weeks. We started gentle active motion and the first day she had no motion at all. We initiated formal therapy about two weeks later. At that point, she had about 30 degrees at the PIP joint of flexion. And I fabricated this little blocking splint um, to really support the joint, allow her to start to gently work on PIP joint flexion. Um, when we hit a hard end feel, I just added a stereostatic um, stress to improve her passive motion. And it took a little bit of time, but about eight weeks, this is her flexion, um, but it's just been very slow and steady. And again, it's just a fine line between improving their motion and, um, and causing discomfort and you don't wanna do that. And that's it, thank you. So I'm gonna turn this over. Thank you, Sherry. And we'll move on to, that was great, really informative. And we'll move on to Dr. Rizzo. Dr. Rizzo, we'll just have you unmute. Sorry, thank you for having me. Um, I uh, have no conflicts and I appreciate the opportunity to share and learn. I asked Stephanie, who works with me, Stephanie Canis, uh, how I should frame this in, in the context of this uh, meeting. And she said, uh, focus on indications, implant selection approaches and rationale. And I'm gonna talk about both MCP and PIP arthroplasty from a surgeon's perspective. Thanks Steph for the guidance. Uh, MCP arthritis is um, more, still more, even to this day more predominant in the rheumatoid population group, and they carry with them a whole lot of baggage associated with the soft tissue uh, deformities and, and laxities, that, the incompetence that they have. Um, and there's this predictable pattern of deformity that we see. Uh, many of these patients are uh, treated in, uh, to, in, my, in my algorithm with silicone arthroplasty, which remains actually the most common implant for both PIP and MCP arthroplasty. It's a, it's a, a tried and true option, although there's a lot of room for improvement. And some of the bigger problems associated with it are the recurrent deformities and the implants tend to fracture. Silicone synovitis is, uh, occurs, but it's not as, not as common in my experience. We looked at our experience with silicone in uh, 325 joints uh, uh, over a seven-year average follow-up, and we found that that the survivorship was really quite good. But you have to take that with a grain of salt because uh, just because they survive doesn't mean that the patients are happy. We had a substantial implant fracture rate, uh, rate at 15 years, which is consistent with previous studies. And we also found that with that implant fracture rate, that the, the deformity, recurrent deformity was also common. So what happens to a lot of these patients is they become deformed again, but they sort of live with it. They don't come back asking for more, more procedures. So just because the survivorship's good doesn't mean it always translates to a happy patient. I will say this though, we did have significant improvement in pain and motion, and it didn't seem that implant fracture was associated with poor outcomes. And that's, that's consistent with the series that was described in Reddington. So while we had very good survival rates uh, and, and implant fracture rates, I have to say that uh, that uh, uh, the study is in encouraging in some ways, but it also uh, uh, doesn't really tell the whole story. Uh, what about non-constrained implants, whether it be the SR implant in the upper right-hand corner or the pyrocarbon in the, in the uh, lower right-hand corner? The pyrocarbon was introduced around the turn of the century, and uh, Dr. Beckenbaugh, who trained me, was one of the big uh, pioneers in this, and their, new, their original outcome suggested that it was a good option for rheumatoids. I, I, I beg to differ. I think that it's good for osteoarthritis, which is, a, uh, here's a case example of a patient with bilateral index and middle finger uh, MCP arthritis. And here's the lateral x-rays. 
And I'm gonna take you through the technique real quick on another patient who had just index finger MCP arthritis. And typically you do it through a, a dorsal approach and I split the tendon in the osteoarthritic patients. So, and after exposing the tendon, splitting the capsule, you identify the start point for your, your all and your, your alignment guide to make your, your cut. And with the pyrocarbon system, you make your cut uh, partially with the cutting guide and then ultimately finish it freehand as you can see through this video. You want to be careful, protect the collateral ligaments because uh, they're going to be uh, the major stabilizers. So this cut should be made distal to the collateral ligament origin. Um, and then this is after you make the cut. Now you can broach at this point up to the largest possible size, but I would probably not broach to the largest possible size because you have to match the proximal and distal broaches. So you want to make your uh, distal cut uh, um, which is actually just perpendicular to the axis on both the uh, on on both the uh, coronal and uh, sagittal planes, and you only want to take just a little bit of the proximal uh, uh, phalanx, just enough to expose and 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 balance the the bone cuts. So especially in cases of deformity, um, and then you broach the distal, and after you've broached both, you trial it. Uh, I, I'm sure here a lot of the therapists experience patients who have stiffness and they have an ability to extend. You want to be able to hyperextend these patients just a little bit intraoperatively. If, if you don't get that touch of hyperextension, you're probably overstuffed, and then you're in a bit of a you're you're in a bit of a uh, uh, you're going to end up with probably a stiff patient in the end. But if you can get that touch of hyperextension, like I'm showing in the top left hand corner, I think the patient will generally be pretty happy. And you want to, of course, want to make sure they're stable, varus valgus. And then you put the final implant in, you close the interval um, with, I uh, use vicral sutures now. And ultimately, uh, this is a, a splint that holds MPs extended, allowing for IP uh, flexion for uh, two to two weeks. You can even go longer. The MPs are pretty forgiving. So I tend to sort of be, uh, if I'm concerned at all, they're on the side of longer. And this is that patient 10 years post-op. And here's that original patient who ended up having both sides treated uh, four years on the right and uh, three years on the left. And our, our experience suggests that we're pretty happy with these in the setting of osteoarthritis. Um, all, these, all these parameters of a clinical outcome improved. Uh, survivorship was 98% uh, at two years and 93% at five years in, in terms of uh, implant survival and reoperation rates were slightly lower. We ultimately concluded that this was a good, uh, and it remains a good option for the osteoarthritic MCP joint. Is there a role for non-constrained MCP arthroplasty in RA? Short answer is no. And uh, I can show you through an example, but the challenges of the soft tissues are really quite diff difficult. Bone quality is poor in the RA patients. And here's a sad story of a patient who underwent MCP arthroplasties. Uh, and you can see at five years post-op, she has recurrent deformity, pain. She had stiff, MCP joints, she had intrinsic tightness, PIP were uh, were held stiff in extension. I had to stage her to reconstruct her. We did the silicone implants first, and then we had to come back and, and treat the PIPs. And ultimately she she was better, but it was a, it was an ordeal just to get her over that. Uh, what about PIP arthritis? Well, in PIP arth arthritis, osteoarthritis is the dominant uh, etiology. And when we look in 2023, I think silicone remains the gold standard. And there's several studies that show that it's it's done well. Peter Stern reported his experience with, with actually very favorable survivorship. But what I would say is that this deformity and this coronal plane maintenance of alignment is, is, uh, is really the concern in these patients. And uh, Joe and Briglia and his group looked at their experience as well, and they had a, a more uh, substantial revision rate and complication rate. But they often, uh, uh, the biggest factor associated with reoperation and failure was instability. Let me illustrate an example. This is a woman who's had three previous PIP arthroplasties who came to me and, and with this and really did not want a fusion at this point, which is what I recommended. She also had a, a fixed swan neck deformity of the, um, of the um, ring finger. And ultimately we went ahead and, uh, and revised her and, um, and ultimately I uh, did a, a superficialis hemitinodesis. And at, at first glance, it looks pretty good, but ultimately she failed again. And this is a recurrent theme. Some patients just fail that coronal plane alignment. And ultimately she ended up having to have a fusion which ultimately she ended up being pretty happy with uh, as, as happy as a fusion could be. But, uh, 
it was a it was a lot of years and a lot of reoperations to get there. Non-constrained arthroplasties have a role, I think, in osteoarthritic PIP. Here's a, a case example of a 65-year-old female with index finger PIP, and we can debate whether arthrodesis or arthroplasty is, is indicated in these patients because um, a lot of folks prefer arthrodesis, but I still I still will perform arthroplasty. It's a tough sell to, to convince patients to have fusion sometimes, and this is an example of the procedure. I, I like a dorsal approach for these. I split the I don't split the tendon as much. I've done that many times, but I like the Chamay approach as uh, as I was taught in my training. And then after you expose the joint, you you can make your uh, cuts. The cuts are perpendicular to the axis and the plane. You have to make a chamfer cut to sort of allow or accommodate the implant. This is the SR implant that I'm using. The distal cut is often very difficult. I don't take hardly any bone because many of them are concave at this point. I use a Swanson burr to, to create a hole and then I just prepare the, the surface to accommodate an implant. And then you broach up to the largest possible size. Uh, and ultimately, uh, you want to confirm stability. Like the MCP, you want to make sure that you protect the collateral ligaments. Sometimes you have to release the roller plate a little bit to accommodate the implant and, and ensure that you can get full extension. Um, so that's uh, not an uncommon um, feature for the procedure. And uh, this is, uh, you want to be able to extend fully. Uh, the PIP is a terribly unforgiving joint, as we all know. And uh, and uh, so I get a little cynical sometimes about the probability of being able to really affect motion and, and make a difference. I, I hold them in extension, and we have an elaborate therapy protocol, which I won't belabor. Um, this is a three-month uh, post-op for that patient. And this is that original patient with the index finger four years post-op. And, and you can get home runs in these cases. So this is a nice case of, a, of an excellent outcome. And Peter Murray looked at uh, our sort of Mayo experience like, uh, with this, which are, with Dr. Lenshide, who actually designed this implant and had very good survivorship. But here, I want you to focus on all of these procedures I, uh, for tenolysis release of contractures, both on the flexor and extensor side. And what we found is that a little worried about stiffness after PIP arthroplasty. If they're stiff after PIP arthroplasty, the science does not support that you're going to be able to surgically improve their range of motion. And this is a study that we, we looked at where 324 joints. First reoperation was mainly for stiffness. Second reoperation was mainly for stiffness. Third reoperation was mainly for stiffness. In each case, we failed. We cannot predictably improve motion with surgery. Occasionally, we'll get a home run. But by and large, when you look at it from a 10,000 foot view, we don't predictably improve motion. The pyrocarbon PIP has been around also for about uh, over 20 years now. And uh, you can get pretty good results with this. This is 12 year post-op and next finger. But pyrocarbon does not fare as well in, my, in, in our experience. We had 170 cases with a six year average follow-up. And we found particularly the post-traumatic patients did poorly. And uh, a lot of them have associated soft tissue, problems. The rheumatoids did not fare as bad as we thought they would, but the, the post-traumatics did uh, fared uh, poorly. A lot of this is because we, we operate a lot less on rheumatoid PIPs with arthroplasty. Um, but loosening was associated. We get these catastrophic loosenings, as you can see in these images that can occur, and that is associated with a poor outcome. So beware of the post-traumatic patient and also those, uh, 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 those who um, have loosening because they are linked to worse outcomes. So let me summarize real quick. Dakey uh, looked at a prospective randomized study saying which implant's best and ultimately concluded that the silicone implant is the one that had less reoperations, although there was a trend towards increased uh, range of motion with the SR implant. Just a brief comment about surgical approach. Uh, I'll summarize this very, very neatly by saying it doesn't matter, but you can do a lateral approach uh, and you can split the collateral so that you can tension appropriately. And uh, it's a little bit squeamish when you sort of have to shotgun the joint as I'm about to do here uh, and, uh, and put these implants in. You gotta be careful when you shotgun. If you're too aggressive, you can cause neuropraxia. And then you can reduce and tension the, uh, the, uh, the uh, repair uh, to accommodate um, the, uh, the implant. And these patients obviously move right away, but to be frank with you, I don't know that it matters. Uh, our experience has not shown that it's given us better range of motion. The bowler approach is uh, is uh, often better for silastic implants. Uh, you go between the uh, 
the uh, uh, A2 and A4 pulleys and retract the tendons. You can make your cuts and then um, place the implant and uh, repair the, the, the uh, volar plate. Um, again, my own personal experience is that the approach doesn't matter. The joint's going to do what it wants to do. There are studies that also support that the, occasionally you'll read a study where a range of motion is better with a uh, with certain approach, but when you look at it from a 10,000 foot view, it really doesn't, there's not enough science to say. Uh, Peter Murray did suggest that if you're not going to, for the non-silicone implants, the, the volar approach is, is, is a poor idea, and I agree with that. So in summary, implant arthroplasty is, still has a role in treatment, and I I, uh, as you can see, I'm I'm a fan. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, it is a struggle sometimes, technically challenging. Um, BIP uh, hates us and uh, will do what it wants to do. I tell patients there's a 47 degree arc of motion you'll get. That's the average for the PIP, regardless of how you how you rehab them. Uh, the MCP is much more for forgiving. Uh, I think OA and the MCP. I think modular implants are really good. Silicone for RA. Uh, for both uh, groups, um, uh, largely a lot of folks will say silicone is the, the gold standard for all PIP, but I do think that the uh, the, the modular implants would be good for OA of the PIP. Um, but um, I, uh, I think by, by and large, most surgeons prefer the, uh, the silicone implants for the PIP. Thank you. Wow, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Rizzo. We'll go ahead and turn over to Gary Solomon. Hi, thank you everybody. And thank you, Dr. Rizzo. Um, I'll pile on a couple of things that you mentioned um, during my presentation, just the, the importance of function versus range of motion, I think can't be overemphasized. So I, I know I'll come back to that a little bit because motion isn't really what you're going for with these. Um, I have no relevant disclosures. The goal is really to, oh, let me get on slideshow, I apologize. That's better. So the goal of rehabilitation is really to improve hand function and decrease pain during grasp, prehension, and then translation, rotation, and shift. Those hand functions of shifting an object between the palms of the fingers or moving across the fingertips. So you don't necessarily need a ton of motion for those, but they're very important functionally. I don't think you can mention, talk about arthroplasty without talking for a second about arthrodesis because we do get a lot of patients sort of in between the, in that in-between stage where they're trying to figure out which is best for them. Um, it's important to understand that, especially for the index finger, it'll decrease pain, it'll create functional prehension, it to tolerates that lateral stress. Um, so arthrodesis certainly can be beneficial. Um, if someone is considering, I recommend making them an orthosis to determine the ideal position and let them live with them and try different activities for a little bit. Education is extremely important. Arthrodesis means the joint will not move, and sometimes that gets lost in translation to people, and they have to understand that function can be very good, and there's minimal post-op rehabilitation afterwards. But studies do show um, that, um, that a high number of patients prefer having motion, having the option of retaining motion, even if it means that reoperation or other interventions may be necessary down the road. So that leaves us with the choices we just talked about between the semi-constrained and the non-constrained PIP arthroplasties. And I did a presentation with Dr. Kefauver um, last March, and I asked for this slide because he says these are the two most important questions to ask the surgeon. Number one, and I saw a question in the chat box come up. Number one is how badly did you muck up the extensor tendon? Because that'll drive how we can progress the patients. And then as um, Dr. Rizzo also alluded to, how are the collateral ligaments? Because you saw um, that deviation deformity occurs quite often. So let's start with the silicone PIP arthroplasty. Your orthosis, the purpose is to protect the disrupted structure. So the dorsal surgical approach is most common, a resting hand, usually PIP extension, and you're protecting that central slip. Alternatively, just a digital gutter. Um, for the volar approach, usually a PIP dorsal block, protect the volar plate, and a lateral approach, usually including the adjacent digit towards the disrupted side. Um, again, as he talked about, there's no real difference between the approaches except some advantage possibly for volar for range of motion. Just some pearls and pitfalls. One, we do want to start immediate edema control, but I teach patients not to do the rotational stress and rotational wrapping. 
So we like to do just a, a little finger cuff and then teach them to trim. And I usually have them wrap right away over their bandages. When we are clear to stop moving, depending on the extensor tendon, I like to start with a little template. I like to use a, a Luma foam with a dorsal approach, usually begin with a 30 degree arc. If it's a palmar approach, protect the volar plate. So I'll limit that last 20 degrees of extension. And lateral approach, I like the PIP hinge when we start doing motion. Just general progression. I don't like doing protocols because everyone's a little different depending on the condition, again, of the ligaments and, and the extensor tendon. But once you do about two weeks of active, you can usually do a little passive. Again, you have to stress to avoid that lateral deviation. Don't stress the implant past 70 degrees. And um, remember that success is adequate range of motion for activities of daily living and for pain relief. When you do start moving the fingers and doing gentle grasping activities, I like to start moving all the digits together for extra stability and then upgrade to indiv individual fingers. And you have to remind them constantly about that lateral stress with function. Um, if it's a index or middle finger, I do like the PIP hinge. You have to make sure if they're using buddy straps not to pull over towards that ulnar side. Be very careful with lifting coffee cups and using keys and all those daily activities that people don't realize they're doing, the first thing they'll do when they come in the clinic is lift up the chair and move it to the side and put that ulnar stress on that joint. And now let's move on to the non-constraint because this has changed over the past few years. Um, originally, we used to do a dynamic orthosis, but there were a lot of complications with joint subluxation. So if you are asked to do a dynamic orthosis, make sure that there is no tension when there is at full extension. You have to avoid that PIP hyperextension. As far as recognizing PIP subluxation, it's difficult because we don't have x-ray vision always, but just a couple of red flags. If somebody has difficulty initiating PIP flexion, but if you start to passively move them a little bit and then it picks up, be very suspicious. Also, if they start appearing to have a swan neck deformity or if you palpate volarly at the PIP joint, um, sometimes you can feel it's a little bit more prominent. So the updated recommendations are usually a hand-based or gutter, no PIP hyperextension. Again, edema may deceive you, so don't try to push that joint too far um, into extension. If there's any looseness of the volar plate, block, switch it around and do a PIP dorsal block and just block that end range of PIP extension. Um, usually in that first week, again, there's many different ways to do this, but you're starting just protected range of motion. So I like to initiate short arc again with a template two of them, one just for the DIP and the other for the PIP. And again, I like to use a Luma foam because it's easy for the patients and you just mark the joints and set them with a little target. And then as far as progression, I like to advance about 10 to 15 degrees a week. If you're using a dynamic orthosis, usually I'll get rid of that between three to four weeks, um, six weeks to, to progressively facilitate PIP flexion and then about three months to generally unrestricted activity. Just some pearls, rather than focus on motion, I like to focus on function. Um, again, focus on objects, focus on picking things up, focus on moving things. If you're doing grasp, just do it progressively. Um, but it's real important not to harp too much on, on the range of motion aspect of these. The pitfall is the lateral stress, especially the index and middle and the PIP hyperextension. And as I said, the overemphasis on motion. If you're chasing somebody around with the goniometer, measuring them all the time, they're going to think they're failing because as he just said, the average motion is somewhere between 41, 47, 50 degrees, depending on what the study, what studies you see. Um, but remember that the non-constrained um, and all the implants tend to Pain improves, the motion's approximately the same, and the survivor rate is pretty good. So for your consideration, improvements are usually noted in pain and function no matter what type of implant and approach. There's some favor for the silicone implant and again, some favor for the volar approach for less extension lag. This patient is typical of, of what I see and sort of sums it all up with the PIP arthroplasties. This gentleman had, I believe, at least three um, pyrocarbon implants initially when they first came out. He was a very early adopter. You could see that the index finger was converted to a fusion. The middle finger and ring finger were converted to um, silicone implants. There's still a pyrocarbon in the ring finger MP joint. Weird x-ray, very happy patient, very functional patient. Yes, he's had to come back and do multiple surgeries, 
but he's very, very pleased with his implants because his pain is gone and he can use his hand again. Um, just a note on return to work. Um, this study shows that most people can return within eight weeks to light to medium work. Heavy work tends to be a problem, but for most people, they are able to get back to what they were doing before. And with that, I will pass it to um, Janine to talk about MP joints. Thanks, Gary. Thank you. Well, it's really an honor to be here. I want to thank AAHS and ASHT for the opportunity to be part of this wonderful panel. I have, I have nothing to disclose. I want to talk a little bit today about um, postoperative management of metacarpal phalangeal joint implant resection arthroplasty. And uh, it's been highly affected by the biologic drugs. Um, compare a little bit about silicone and pyrocarbon and talk about to be dynamic or static and um, some of the long-term outcomes. So we used to see lots and lots of these. And then uh, with the uh, onset of all the new medications, um, we saw less, but it seems that things are happening after two decades of these biologic medications. Uh, some of our patients, when they go on Medicare, can't afford them um, and, and uh, things happen. So uh, although, um, there, there was a decline in surgery rates. Um, there was really two referral camps for these patients. Uh, the rheumatologist often considered, um, if they referred to the hands uh, surgeon, that it was a failure of their medical management. And um, the hand surgeons really wanted to get them earlier. Um, so uh, there was less coming to therapy. But if they do show up in your office, <laughs> you know, what, what, are you going to do? And that is, um, you need to know what type of implant. And I want to thank Dr. Rizzo for going through all the outcomes and indications for the different implants um, here. And so once they come in, you, you have to kind of decide as the therapist what protocol the surgeon might want. But they're you know, do you want to go static or dynamic? And uh, I think you all know that these dynamic orthoses are quite a bit of work. Um, and you may be just tempted <laughs> to uh, to go static. Um, there's one study here by Burr in the Journal of Hand Therapy that placed patients in extension and alternated with static flexion. They'd come out for exercises. And uh, here we are still busy making our, our orthosis um, this is about as quickly as I work um, sometimes, <laughs> but um, the, um, the, the, the thing you might want to consider is not only whether you want to do static or dynamic, but um, the rotational components of the finger and do they have a, a pronation deformity? Do they need um, possibly a supination a force couple to maintain the supination position that the surgeon um, has, uh, has achieved? And so um, is it static? Is it dynamic? They walk in and the bulky and it's time for you to make the orthosis. Well, these uh, research studies have not said this is the best protocols. Um, we know we want a 90 degree line of pull, but, um, you know, our, these patients often will have trouble getting their thumb and index digit together without lateral pinch. And what we're looking for is that beautiful supination where that index digit just comes right over and touches the thumb pad. And, um, Sorry, go back. So Dr. Swanson, he would even put the implant in slightly tilted here so that when the implant went in, it would kind of spring into supination and we would reinforce the new uh, joint and soft tissues with a supinatory force couple. So in these cases, you may want to consider dynamic as opposed to a static option. So you really are getting that good pad to pad pinch with the index digit. Um, our friends at Mayo use uh, silicone, I'm sorry, um, disome and rotational slings. Glory DeVore used to use tape. Some even putting um, uh, Velcro on a fingernail and, and using that to 
do that. And I think this is, as we as we saw fewer of these, this rotational component of the index digit, we really need to focus on, not just our getting the flexion and extension that we want, especially more with the ulnar digits than, than the radial because they're hanging on to objects and the others are doing the, the pinch. Um, once you get this beautiful result though, you know, a, a night orthosis is really recommended for a long-term wear, the protocols vary, um, but it really is important. It's kind of like, you know, you get your teeth straightened and you need a retainer. So let's maintain that beautiful posi uh, position. Um, the outcomes um, really, uh, although the range of motion may not be that much changed um, and there, the, nor grip and pinch, the quality of how individuals uh, do their activities of daily living was greatly improved with MP implant resection arthroplasty um, in this qualitative study. So it's really this, uh, it's really important that you get this, the surgeon, therapist, and patient working together with good rapport and communication um, and uh, meeting the those individual needs of each patient. So if you're in Grand Rapids, come visit me at Raleigh Finkelstein Hall. Thank you. Thank you, Janine. We'll turn that over to Haley to wrap up. There we go. Gail, is my audio working correctly? Sounds great. Oh, thank you so much. All right, everyone, welcome. It is so exciting for me to be here joining you today. I want to also say thank you to ASHT and AHS. These organizations have just been formative on my career as a hand therapist. So it's a great honor to be joining this incredible panel of speakers. So this is a collaborative process for these elective arthroplasties. My name is Haley Van Escobar. I do not have any financial disclosures relevant to this presentation. However, I do want you to know a little about me. Uh, I am the owner of Restore Performance. I'm an AOTA approved provider of professional development. And I also am a clinical specialist for naked prosthetics. So I work with musicians and I work in partial hand amputation and match people to prosthetic designs. So I know a lot about setting expectations and talking this through with patients. And I'm excited to share some ideas with you. It does not take much strength to do things, but it requires a great deal of strength to decide what to do. That's why we're starting off here thinking about these expectations for these patients. So we will consider the meaning of the term expectations in the context of treatment outcomes, as well as highlight the unique aspects of setting expectations for small joint arthroplasty procedures. And uh, spoiler alert, you've had so much incredible knowledge to this point before I even began that I will simply be highlighting many of the things that you've already heard and hopefully fostering some synthesis of this and making it more applicable to the clinic even tomorrow. What does the word expectation mean? Expectation is a belief that something will happen or be the case in the future. It's also a belief someone will achieve something. It's very future oriented. It has to do with expected value. And why do we need to think about these expectations? Why are we even discussing this? A great outcome can be killed by unmet expectations. And this my friends is called disappointment. Right. And this room, we are full of amazing healthcare providers. We are not in the game of disappointment, but we must know and be aware that the average patient has preposterous expectations about what is going to happen, what we can do. Please, if you have a different experience, if people are getting smarter out there, you chat and you let me know. But wow, it just seems that um, the more I interact with people, just what they expect to work is not reality. They're looking for magic pills and expecting things that just don't match what we can offer them. So I'll talk for a whole nother time, but this is touching on outsourcing the hero, which is a concept of that magic pill that will fix the problem or someone else will come save me and fix it as well as healthcare literacy. So we treat the whole spectrum of humanity, don't we? In our hand therapy clinics, in hand surgery clinics, 
Thinking about where our patients are is important for this discussion. We're building an alliance. We know that recovery expectations are associated with the outcome. It's pretty wild when you think and read those uh, research, which comes out of chronic pain investigations. The provider and patient alliance is actually correlated to the outcome in some ways more predictively than what we actually do with people. So questions for you to begin with. When you're asking this patient and trying to help them problem solve, right? Because they ask us, what should I do? Should I do this? Depending on your setting, you might be really involved in that process. I like to start with, what is the problem? What, what is on your mind with this hand? What is your goal? Can you articulate to it to me? Can we define it? Begin there. I ask the question, what if you still have to do what I taught you several weeks ago or maybe a several years ago to protect your hands? What if that's still part of your daily life? Is that okay? I think about what is their cognition, their cognitive flexibility? Because remember, um, we're going to ask them to still be monitoring these joints. We're going to have them adapting their activities, right? What's their tissue health? This is certainly a collaborative discussion with the surgeon. And think about the ability to adhere to the time in the splint. Are they aware they're signing up for a nighttime splint for a year or more, depending on the program that you follow, right? So what is the problem? The answer to this question, I like to say it, what brought you to this point? So I don't label it as a problem, right? I just say, what brought you to this discussion? What brought you to bring it to my attention? The answers could be pain, function, appearance, weakness, could be really quite broad. How severe is this problem? That's my next question. And if they say a six or a five, I should say, I'm going to say, why didn't you choose a six? Right. And if I need some variety in my life, I might go the other direction. I'm pulling straight from motivational interviewing here. So if, you know, you said a four out of 10 pain, I'm going to say, why wasn't that a five? Why did you feel, why was a four the right one? And I need that information. I need to understand the person's experience, their understanding level, and what they expect that I can do to help them. And this is my little secret sauce. I love this question. How anxious are you about the problem? And the reason I ask that is because sometimes uh, when you have those very stoic, uh, low reporters, they'll tell you it's a one out of 10 pain, but you know they're really miserable uh, or they're they're covering it. You know, I wanna know, are you worried about this problem, but you're not rating very high? And that's important information for us to know. Moving on here, what is your goal? So I'm being really dramatic. Hopefully nobody comes in and says, I want a new hand or, I want it to be like I was, you know, 10, 20 years ago. But if they said that, right, we would go, wow, this is not a great choice. <laughs> this is not going to give you what you're expecting. That is not what this procedure does, right? What if they say, I want to wear a ring again? Well, that's that's a lot more reasonable, right? That's something more appropriate. You've heard about the arc of motion of what this procedure does provides, right? It is a limited arc of motion. I'm referencing uh, negative 25 to 75 as the arc. It would vary, you know, just be sure you're following the particular design you have. Does that match what they need to do with their hands? And that varies because we all have so many different ways that we interact with the world. So thinking about the motion that they can get from this procedure and does it work with their life? It's a synthesis, right? What if you still have to do joint protection? That is something our patients need to know that's still part of their life. That's already been reviewed in detail, but just a reminder, avoiding the key grip when it's a PIP arthroplasty, right? Lateral force on that index finger. Uh, also cylindrical objects, right? I live in the Northwest. Uh, shout out to Eastern Washington University alumni. Uh, find me on LinkedIn. Um, but if we're drinking coffee, right, and we're picking up our cylindrical objects, that's all lateral force on those joints. So thinking about what they do, how does this joint change match what they do with their life and want to do? A couple other considerations here. There's hardware variables. So considering, you know, incredible communication with the surgeon, what to expect from what's done, uh, what the load abilities are. Considering that our small finger has more fragile tissue than maybe the middle finger, right? Or what if it has a history of surgery, right? All of these really kind of um, unpredictable variables come into this discussion. Um, again, I touched on this briefly, how 
creative are they? Are they good problem solvers or not really? Are they someone that we need to walk through things and spend more time in therapy training with? Um, and then how about, you know, expectations for using a splint? Oh, and I like to point out just the, the weird things that sometimes our patients bring in um, can result in just unpredictable things during recovery, you know, more edema, slower progress might be related to underlying gout or a different type of arthritic condition. So questions to answer as we wrap up here. What are the other treatment options? Why is this procedure recommended? What are the benefits? We have to be able to play with all these different questions, answer what's the life term of this type of procedure? What should you expect, right? There's that expect word during recovery or rehabilitation. Is it about motion? It's not about motion, right? Um, are there long-term precautions if you have this? And the answer is yes. And I love that. What happens if you don't go forward with this? It's a good question to be ready to talk through. So practical thoughts, invite the family member. This is so well known that it is so hard for anyone to remember what happens during a medical appointment. So bring a, a wingman or a teammate to, to take notes. Uh, and on that note, provide written information to your patient. Use peer mentors if you can. That might really seem left field, but um, I studied resilience quite a bit this year. And that's one of the really important themes in fostering resiliency is having a peer mentor or a mentor that you can identify with. So if it's appropriate, consider how you can use that. And it's a team effort. So get great communication on your team, great communication with your patient and their family. All right, what makes it unique? It's not about motion. There are hardware variables, load precautions, thinking about which digit is being treated. Are they all being treated? How many times have they been treated? And remembering that they may still have to live through those ergonomic strategies and joint protection, even if they have a small joint arthroplasty. My presentation has been evidence-based and um, I just want to say thank you so much for your kind attention. I want to say thank you to Gail and Stephanie from the webinar team for supporting me in this content development. And I will hand over the screen for Q&A. Thank you so much, Haley. And that is 8.59. That's an impressive wrap up. So I'm going to invite all the speakers to go ahead and turn their camera on so we can have uh, about five or 10 minutes of Q&A. Um, I also invite any of the attendees to take a moment to post your questions in the chat box so that we can have a uh, discussion with our esteemed panel while they are still here with us. Um, go ahead and do that. So one of the questions came from our dear friend, Sue Mekovitz up in upstate New York. And I just want to uh, offer that question because it, um, and that is it, because it was one of the discussions that we had in, in uh, coming up with this topic this evening. And that was how the, um, the biologics and the pharmaco pharmaceutical interventions for um, rheumatoid arthritis, how that has impacted our, uh, the surgical approaches, our patient population, the people returning to our clinics uh, to have these addressed. And maybe even some of the speakers can think, uh, mention maybe how that their, um, the therapy speakers, I'm sorry, can uh, address how, what they see in their clinic and and that's, so I'm going to go ahead and turn that over to Dr. Marco. You know, Sue had pointed out some of your studies were from a little bit earlier. And do you feel like um, that's changed at all in the past several years? I think so. I think there's two, <clears throat> there's two sides to that coin. Um, one is I do think the biologics, not only are they not requiring overall left need for surgery, but they're actually optimizing the outcomes of surgery. Um, I have patients tend to do better, I think, longer term uh, because they're on better control medicines. The flip side of that coin, at least as a surgeon, um, I'm, I'm seeing that uh, a lot of the community hand surgeons aren't really treating uh, RA as much. It's a little bit intimidating. So 
we at the referral centers uh, still get quite a bit. In fact, I was mentioning to Sue that I think I see more of it now than ever. So the irony is, and, and it's not unusual for someone not to pick on Chicago, Gary, because, um, but someone, and I only see the numerator, but they come all the way from Chicago. They're like, look, uh, I couldn't find a hand surgeon who was, you know, uh, comfortable or, or had the bandwidth to really, um, to, to, to take this on. And they said, go see, um, Mayo. So, um, that's the that's the downside. It's become very specialized. I think back and Janine can speak to this. I'm sure, but back in the 80s and and 90s, uh, you know, a lot of community hand surgeons were doing a lot of rheumatoid. I mean, it was it was there. Uh, the DMARDs have honed down the number of patients, but it's also maybe not a, not allowed of the of the community hand surgeons to be exposed to enough RA to really feel comfortable managing on a routine basis. So it's become more esoteric and more niche. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I, uh, I, we do. We have to remember that these biologics are not a cure. They do help manage the condition, but rheumatoid arthritis is still there. And, and I think that what we're seeing is over time, maybe a much longer time, they may need surgery at some time. And so now it's, a decade later, they've been on the drug for 10 years, and maybe it's time for them to, they need surgery, and we're, we need surgeons <laughs> and hand therapists that are aware of what to do with this condition. And, and maybe that's why this webinar is as popular as it is tonight. <laughs> I don't know. So. Gary, any thoughts from your side on that? So you nod in your head. You know, it's it's interesting to see because we did used to see more rheumatoids come through the clinic. Rheumatoid patients come through the clinic, probably not as many now as, as 10, 15 years ago. Um, I think a lot is managed by the rheumatologist. There's still that culture, a lot of rheumatologists not sending patients to hand surgeons. Um, patients sometimes will seek it out on their own, but it, it, there still seems to be that cultural divide where um, we, we, there were some stories told where, where patients actually get in trouble from their rheumatologist for going to see a hand surgeon. So, so there is sometimes that, that non-collaborative process, but I think the biologics have changed the game a little bit. I don't think people, we don't have as many painful people with this severe deformities that we see on, I would say, a regular basis come through. Um, one of the other questions that I have, somebody had messaged me was, um, if you're dealing with somebody with intrinsic tightness, um, uh, and you're doing MCP arthroplasties, well, what is your, do you go ahead and address that operatively? Or is that something that you hope works out after the case? Cause they're running into issues with the MCP, the intrinsic tightness affecting the person's ability to restore that full arc of MCB, both extension and um, getting good PIP motion. Dr. Rizzo, would you go ahead and do anything to release the intrinsics in that situation? Um, I was reading a question, Gail. <laughs> I was reading the question about the silastic implant. Can you repeat? Can you repeat your question real quick? I'm sorry. Oh, I was just saying, if would you um, do anything for somebody that has a particularly his um, uh, tight intrinsic? Um, would you address that? I'm of MCP arthroplasty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, and I don't do an intrinsic transfer. I I do a release. I, there's been some studies that suggest transferring the intrinsics helps, but in fact, I would say. Probably eighty percent of the time, I release intrinsics for those MCP arthroplasties for the rheumatoids, in particular. Now the non-rheumatoids, it's a different story, but uh, very not very often do I need to. But um, I almost look for a reason to release the intrinsics. To be frank, I mean because they are deforming forces, and um, and uh, and I also don't think there's a downside to releasing the owner intrinsics at the very least. I mean, there's even times when I release both the owner and radial intrinsics, but if I do the radial intrinsic, I will try to lengthen it rather than than um, than, um, than release. But to be frank with you, I've done so many revisions now, the, the intrinsics often reconstitute. <laughs> so it doesn't matter what you do, they're gonna be there to some degree, so. 
I, I've become a little bit less uh, dogmatic about, you know, lengthening versus releasing. I do, I have seen some folks who, you know, rehab the, the MCPs a little bit sort of counterintuitively, and that can be quite catastrophic in those cases, especially if they do intrinsic transfers, because they, they can invite intrinsic tightness in a different way, and that can be a big problem, um, particularly once the PIPs become stiff. Once you get the PIPs angry, forget it. It becomes mm -hmm. it becomes very challenging. And too often I see folks like that case that I showed where they waited too long to act, and now they, they, they fixed PIP in extension and that that just dooms the patient to a, an awful result because anybody who has good PIP motion, you do an MCP arthroplasty, even if you immobilize them a long time and they only get this much, they're going to be happy because they'll compensate. So even though the rheumatoids love this because you you take their arc of motion from 45 to 75 and you bring it up from to like 10 to 45 and they love, they can grab objects now and they, and if they have good PIPs, Oh, they are ecstatic. They love it. But if the PIPs are stiff, <laughs> they're not going to be happy. Sorry for the long-winded answer. No, it's great. Right. Thank, you. Thank you. And I think you honed in on a particular thing that a lot of people are also just satisfied in the correction of the appearance. And I think that's often one thing that we uh, don't always mention, you know, when we're talking about the range of motion, people are just happy that their hands have a more um, acceptable, if you will, appearance to them. I was shocked that we actually had statistically significant improvement of MP motion in our silicone implant study. I wasn't, I never tell patients we're going to improve their motion. I tell them all we're doing is shifting your arc of motion from one of flexion to one of extension. And that's all we're hoping for. Uh, and, and they love it. That is the one thing I think is the most satisfying for those patients, being able to get their MPs out. Um, of course, the the, the uh, chronoplane deformity correction is also a very satisfying thing for them all. Um, I'm going to go ahead. I don't see any other questions in the chat. We do see a lot of uh, grateful attendees and comments there. So I want to say thank you to everybody and just give another moment if anybody has a wrap up comment they want to make. Can I verbalize that question I was reading uh, real quick? Uh, yes, please. That, um, from Kathleen Robertson. I, I hope it's okay. She, she typed her name. So um, <laughs> if you place this elastic implant in an MP or an index MCP, even for OA, um, do you instruct them to limit? The, no, I don't. I, I mean, I, I'm consistent with the the spiel of saying, look, this is like a new set of tires. The harder you ride it, the more likely it is to wear out. And I go through the whole spiel. But once their pain goes away, you're not going to likely predictably control their activity level despite your best efforts. I, when I first started, I was telling them, don't lift more than two pounds on a regular basis. Don't lift more than five pounds in a single instance. Yeah. But what I've observed is that once the pain gets better, um, and I haven't noticed a difference in outcome when, when, uh, cause some patients will listen and follow your recommendations, but, um, I, uh, I don't know that, uh, there may be a relationship between the amount of activity they do and a fracture of the implants. Um, but I haven't been able to prove that, uh, I guess intuitively it, yeah, I would say yes, but, uh, proving it is a different matter. Um, I, yeah, I would agree. Patients are going to live the life they want to live. So, well, I'm going to go ahead. Uh, thank you everybody for joining. I'm going to go ahead and turn this back over to Sono. Uh, no, thanks. Thanks, Gil, for your excellent moderating. And, you know, thanks to our outstanding speakers for your wonderful talks. Just really awesome. And I think it really highlights the importance of the collaboration between the surgeon and therapist for the complete care of patients with small joint arthroplasty. And, and to be honest, for everything we do in hand surgery, and uh, thanks to the ASHT for the collaboration with this webinar. And finally, I want to thank you, the audience, for tuning in and spending your evening with us. Uh, please keep Saturday morning, February 17th, marked on your calendar for our global hand-in-hand -hand webinar series. We're doing a combined webinar on wrist arthroscopy with the Asian Pacific Federation of the Society of Surgery of the Hand and the Asian Pacific Wrist Association. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks. Thanks again for inviting me. I appreciate it. Have a good night, everyone. Yes, thank you. Have a good night.